call. And uh, in some sense, it's based on collaboration we had, I had earlier, I mean, at least my side with uh, Hiraku and uh, uh, Kota Yoshioka, at least. Uh, there are some similar. It's uh, okay. So I work overseas. And I want to study the topology of some moduli spaces of sheaves on uh, algebraic surfaces. Okay. So uh, maybe to start a bit slower, I just uh, want to say what uh, do I understand by a moduli space in algebraic geometry, roughly. So, uh, so by this I mean essentially this is an algebraic variety or scheme. Is it big enough? Uh, uh, <coughs> that uh, M that parametrizes parametrizes uh, some objects, uh, some interesting objects. In algebraic geometry in a natural way. So naturally so parametrizes means that the points of M, so this one could maybe just write M of C, this will just be uh, the objects we are interested in. So for instance, the sheaves. And um, uh, naturally, it's compatible with families. So for instance, if E over pi over T is some family of objects parametrized by some scheme T. So that means the fiber, for instance, the fiber of pi over a point T and T will be the object, one of these objects. So then there is a natural map uh, from T to M, which sends the uh, point T and T to the fiber. And this is a morphism, so it's an algebraic map somehow given by polynomials. So this is very roughly the thing, depending on what objects one wants to study, for instance, uh, for sheaves, could be for modelized piece of sheaves, it would, could be sheaves up to coherent sheaves up to isomorphism, could be vector bundles, it could be curves, whatever. <coughs> so the example which is important for us is the Hilbert scheme of points. Because the whole story is built on this thing. So so I noted Sn with square brackets, or Hilp N. Uh, this is uh, the Hilbert scheme of points, of N points on the surface. So a general point of S will correspond uh, to just a set, P1 to Pn of n distinct points. And uh, I should maybe say in general, Sn parametrizes uh, zero dimensional uh, subschemes of uh, degree n on S. So as I said, a general 
generically, this is just n different points. But these points can come together, and then you have a multiple structure. So such a subscheme Z in Sn is given by an ideal sheaf. Iz in the among OS um, or the holomorphic or regular functions. So these are the holomorphic functions or regular functions vanishing on the subscheme Z. And uh, such that the quotient, so this is, a, if you want, just a, an ideal in the ring of, you know, in, in all holomorphic functions, such that the quotient is uh, a finite dimensional vector space and uh, has finite support. So the quotient is OZ, which is just all holomorphic functions divided by its ideal sheet, uh, has finite support. So only over finitely many points, the fiber of this quotient is non-zero, and the degree of the subscheme, which is uh, the dimension of, uh, if you want, the sections of OZ, so just uh, everything which is in the quotient, is a finite dimensional quotient, is just the dimension of this quotient, um, which I can write is the sum over all the points in the support of Z, so where this thing has support, uh, of the dimension locally at the point, so the local ring at the point times, uh, so if I take the sum over the, this dimension of this thing, is the sum over the dimension of the fibers of this thing over the points where it lives, and this should be n. And so if these are n distinct points, then this ideal sheaf are just the functions which vanish to first order at these points, and then uh, you, know, you just have a one-dimensional vector space at every point, and it adds up to n. Okay, very simple. <coughs> let's look at some, just uh, from concrete list, let's look at some very simple examples. So we have that the Hilbert scheme of zero points on S uh, just consists of one point, which is the empty set. Hmm? Then the Hilbert scheme of one point consists, uh, is just S, namely the set of all points P in S. And the uh, Hilbert scheme of two points, uh, two points, is a bit more subtle. So either you can have two distinct points, or you have one point plus some ex additional structure so that the quotient has dimension two. And it turns out this is the same as a point P plus T, a tangent vector to S at P. Um, up to up to multiplication, so up to rescaling the tangent vector, and so uh, this thing will be. It turns out that this thing is obtained as follows: We take s times s, we blow it up along the diagonal, and we divide by the action of the symmetric group, which permutes these two factors, and the action lifts to the blow up. Okay, and the later ones will be a bit more complicated. So this thing is, as you can see in these small cases, is, is related to the symmetric power, which is a simpler thing, parametrizing endpoints. So this is just Sn with round brackets or sum 
and S, which is just the n fold product divided by the action of the symmetric group by permuting the factors. And this will parameterize just n points counted with multiplicities. So it's a formal linear combination, sum n i p i, the p i i and s. The n i are distinct points. Um, the n i are some positive integers. And the sum of the n i is equal to n. Okay, so that's uh, very simple. <clears throat> and uh, there is a, a, an obvious map which forgets this scheme structure and just remembers the multiplicity, sending a scheme to its support with multiplicities, which is called the Hilbert Chow morphism. Which is, turns to be an algebraic morphism, so given by polynomials. So P from the Hilbert scheme of endpoints to the semantic power, which, as I said, sends a subscheme to its support with multiplicities. So, by which I mean the sum over all points where the subscheme lives. The multiplicity at that subscheme, which is the dimension of this local space, times the formal sum times the point. Okay. And so, for a surface, this um, Hilbert scheme, uh, this symmetric power will be singular because you have. Uh, some co dimension. I mean, the, the fixed low uh, side of the action are not in the right co dimension. So then it follows that, so this Hilbert scheme, however, is non singular. And um, uh, of dimension. Uh, complex dimension, 2n, and uh, it's actually a resolution of singularities. Of the symmetric power. So this is a very simple example of such a modelized space. And uh, <coughs> now uh, you can also, in simple cases, if S is uh, simply connected, I can also view this as a modelized space of rank one sheaves by looking at, is, at the corresponding ideal sheaves. So it's an example of the modelized spaces of sheaves you want to consider. And so therefore, we can look at the topological invariance. And so there's, uh, for instance, the simplest one one can think of is the topological Euler number. So this is, so for space, topological or number of x will just be the sum of the alternating sum of the depth Betty numbers, two times complex dimension of x of minus one to the i, the dimension of the ith cohomology group, some integer and the, an old result says that if I take the Euler number of the, if I look, want to look at the Euler number of this symmetric power, then it's particularly nice to write a generating function. And uh, it's given by this attractive product formula. So we have a simple formula. We take the product of all integers, one minus t to the n. It happens to be that if you have it without the order number, it's the generating function for partitions. Uh, and to take this to the, just the power of the order number of the surface, this gives you the generating function here. And it's also interesting for us that if I look um, 
at this factor here. Um, so this product, 1 minus t to the n, this is um, up to a trivial factor, t. Uh, if I now call t q to make it more uh, uh, nice, uh, I mean more familiar. So the, this is up to this trivial factor, uh, the Dirichlet eta function, which is uh, you know the, the 24th root of the uh, discriminant modular form, and so it's a nice modular form. And so in particular, we also see that uh, this Euler number, uh, the generating function for the Euler numbers is expressed in terms of modular forms, in this case, just by this one modular form. And so we want to, um, so the aim would be get a similar formula Uh, for modular spaces. Of sheaves on S. Also a nice generating function in terms of modular forms. Okay. Though most of you will know, I'll briefly review uh, modular spaces of sheaves on surfaces. So, so we take S smooth projective. surface, so that means it can be embedded into some projective space as a closed subvariety over, always, I work always over C. H should be an ample line bundle. So that means there is an embedding, I mean, essentially, it means if I, have, I can have an embedding of S into projective space, so that this is the pullback of the hyperplane bundle. Uh, and uh, we fix the rank R, which I assume positive, the first Schoen class in the second cohomology, and uh, C2 in the uh, fourth cohomology, which one by can always identify with the integers if I assume that S is uh, reducible. Uh, I expect you know what the churn classes are. So, so the churn class of a vector bundle are some invariants. Uh, Ci of E associated to a vector bundle in the 2 i cohomology of whatever uh, the vector bundle lives on, which somehow uh, tell us something about how far E is from being topologically trivial. For instance, if this would be the trivial vector bundle, then uh, all churn classes would be zero. And um, so we want to so study moduli spaces of rank two of, well, for the moment, in general, rank are uh, torsion-free coherent sheaves on S uh, with these churn classes, with uh, churn classes. C1 of E is equal to this given C1. C2 of E is equal to C2. I mean, I don't know, uh, maybe some of you don't know what a sheaf is. So you can think of a sheaf 
as a vector bundle with some singularity, so there are some fibers where the dimension is of the fiber is larger than the rank of the bundle. And the torsion-free sheaf would essentially mean it has only finitely, you know, on a surface, you know, it's not quite true, but essentially it means it has only finitely many singularities and they are not too bad. Okay, so just to have some vague idea. Okay, so there, now, so there's no modelized space of all these sheaves. You need to put some condition, which is a stability condition, which somehow means that these sheaves don't have too big subsheaves. Or if they were vect or, you know, for vector bundle, it would mean that they don't have too big subbundles or subsheaves. Where big means having many sections. So, um, so let me just remind you. So we have, um, so if E is a coherent sheaf on some scheme X or some variety, then we have the ith sheaf cohomology. So H0 is, the, is just the global sections. And the HI are somehow, high HI is some kind of the obstructions, some obstructions to having global sections. And then we have the uh, holomorphic Euler characteristic. Of E is just the alternate is again like the Euler characteristic before the alternating sum of the uh, sheaf cohomology group. So it's chi of x e, which is defined to be the sum from i equals zero to the dimension of x until which minus one to the i, the dimension as a vector space of h i of x e. Okay, and then now uh, let's let E be a coherent sheaf on our surface S, and H was ample, ample line bundle. Uh, then uh, we have the Hilbert polynomial. This will be uh, just, uh, we take this the polynomial in some number m uh, is just the holomorphic order characteristic of E, so of E tensor H to the m. This turns out, for instance, by Riemann Roch or by whatever, to be a polynomial in M. And um, then I should maybe say for what follows, one doesn't really need to talk about this. If M is sufficiently large, then there will be no higher cohomology, so this thing is just the global sections. And then uh, we find that, uh, so then the definition is that uh, definition, so a torsion free sheaf E on S uh, is called H semi stable. If uh, for all subsheaves, uh, f of e, um, we have uh, that if we take the well, it shouldn't be zero. So uh, if we take the Hilbert polynomial of the subsheaf and divide by the rank of f, 
this is always smaller equal to the thing for E. Um, so as a polynomial, which means if I put M into it, this will be true for all M sufficiently large. And as I said, uh, if M is large enough, this is actually, this is actually the global sections uh, of E tensor O of M and F tensor O of M. So it also just means that Schapp's sheaves are not allowed to have too many sections as compared to the sections of F. Um, so, okay. And then there is the theorem that such a moduli space for these things exists. Um, there exists. Ah, I should maybe have said, so if this inequality is always strict, when I assume f is non-zero, and here we also, obviously, f is not equal to e, then it's called stable, instead of semi-stable. So there exists, a, whatever that means, cause, this is a technical thing that we are not going to use, moduli space. Uh, M S H R C one C two uh, of uh, H stable uh, H semi stable torsion free sheaves on S with given churn classes, so of rank R, and uh, first churn class given C1, and the second churn class given C2, which is a, a projective variety, so which I, so this is M, or not necessarily variety, but it's projective scheme, M S R. Uh, C1, C2 is projective. Uh, and inside this, we find as an open subset in the Zariski topology, uh, the uh, space which parameterizes all the stable sheaves. So, not like this. And so this is then quasi projective. Okay. So now <clears throat> we want to study the topology of this thing. Um, there's uh, one problem, and there's one thing here. So this moduli space has something called expected dimension. So call it Vd of M, where M is, stands for this. <coughs> so assume maybe so that uh, the first Betty number of S is equal to zero, so that is the dimension of the first cohomology. So this Vd of M is given by some formula, 2RC2 minus R minus 1C1 one squared, so this is the intersection in cohomology, gives us a number, plus R squared minus 1 chi of OS, where this is the polymorphic order characteristic of the trivial bundle. So it has this expected dimension. Um, so, and now first one could ask oneself what 
what's that? It's not actually true that this thing will have this dimension. It's just the dimension that we expect it to have. Um, in, in gauge theory, you have a similar modelized space. Uh, you can look at the modelized space of uh, ASD connections, which corresponds uh, up to gauge to some open subset of this. And this somehow you can describe in terms of some fret home operators. And then you would see you also have an expected dimension here, <coughs> which is the um, but for, for us, just let's say, so Vd of m is for the moment just the dimension that m would have if it was nice. Or, you know, if, uh, let me, for instance, just one way to describe this is the Kuanishi picture. Namely, locally, in the analytic topology, uh, this thing can be written as a zero set of a holomorphic map uh, from some, say, C to the M via this map to C to the K, where uh, the virtual dimension of M is equal to this difference. So near different points of the modelized space, you, these numbers might jump, but the difference is always the same. <coughs> and uh, so thus, if this was a, a smooth map in the sense that it's a submersion, so the differential is surjective, um, uh, then it would follow that this modelized space uh, would be non-singular uh, of dimension equal to this virtual dimension. Okay. So we'll come back to this in a moment because in uh, this fact somehow will allow us to pretend uh, later that the modelized space is smooth in a certain sense. So now let me talk about this buffer written formula, um, which is a kind of some generalization to these modelized spaces. of uh, this formula I had for the Euler number of the Hilbert scheme. So we uh, say, again, S is a smooth a projective algebraic, algebraic surface, as before. Uh, H is ample on S. And we also assume, as we a moment ago, that the first Bertie number of S is zero. And we also assume that so-called geometric genus of S is bigger than zero. So this is the dimension of uh, the sections of the canonical line bundle. So the, the uh, canonical line bundle, the sections of these are the holomorphic two forms. So that means uh, S has non-zero holomorphic two forms. Global non-zero holomorphic two forms. So an example would be S is a K3 surface, or an elliptic surface, or a surface of general type. Well, not always, but many surfaces of general type, most. So, 
So <clears throat> under suitable, we make a restriction. So we choose our H and C1 and C2 such that stability is the same as semi-stability. So first, we assume we put ourselves in the situation that our rank is 2 for now. And then I write the moduli space just like this. So it's understood that the rank is 2. And then I want to say I make, uh, I choose these such that this is equal to the ample one, to the stable ones. This will very often be the case. It's basically, it's mostly a condition on C1. Uh, but uh, we can also make, uh, so there's a course condition on C1, which will guarantee this. And uh, a finer one, if the one for C1 doesn't hold, uh, which will also guarantee it. But it's not always the case. And uh, let's remember, uh, in this rank 2 case, we have our virtual dimension given, I mean, by this formula, uh, 4C2 minus C1 squared minus 3 times chi of s And um, <coughs> uh, we will write uh, Ks squared is just, we evaluate, no, this is, we take the first germ class of this line bundle take its square and we integrate it over S. So we get a number. Uh, and then we will, uh, and so then I make another assumption which is not necessary. It just makes the formulation of the result simpler well, of the statement. Namely, let's assume for simplicity We assume there exists an irreducible curve curve in the linear system Ks. So that means there exists curve C, which is irreducible. For instance, if you want a non-singular connected curve, uh, which is a zero set of a section where S is a section of the canonical line bundle, and C is irreducible. Okay, so in this case, we get uh, the following buffer written formula. So which is uh, one of the statements. Uh, so we write down, again, this eta of x with a bar is uh, what I had before. You take this the eta function times x to the minus 1 over 24. So this is the product 1 minus x to the n. And uh, we also look at the, so this is a modular form up to this trivial factor. We also look at the standard theta function, theta of x, which is just the sum over all the integers uh, x to the n squared. So these are two examples of modular forms. And then, so if you write it out, no, this is 1 plus 2x plus 2x to the 4 and so on. And uh, so I just write now Cs of x is the following expression. You take 8 times 1 over twice this eta bar of x to the 12, and this I take to the pi of OS, and I uh, multiply this by 2 times eta of x, so eta bar of x to the 4 squared. Huh. Yeah, I didn't leave enough room, so maybe I write here. So 2 times eta of x to the 4 squared divided by this theta of x we had. And this I take to the power ks squared. So I write down this uh, crazy power series. 
Uh, and then the, the waffle witten formula is that uh, the Euler number of this modelized space, so rank two sheaves with certain class C1, C2 under suitable assumptions, should just be the coefficient of x to the virtual dimension of m of this power series. Okay. So I have to say a few things to that. So the first thing is that, uh, as also Pavel mentioned in his talk, the, there's this more general buffer Witten invariance, which in more terms, uh, uh, and uh, the buffer Witten, the complete buffer Witten formula talks about also that. This is only a part of the formula coming from this modelized space of sheaves. So let me just write this down for once because it will also be mentioned by other people. <coughs> So the actual uh, waffer written invariant so which is what is used um, in uh, I mean what's in the paper by Waffer and Witten uh, was uh, was given was defined mathematically by uh, Tanaka and Thomas. And then for this, we consider uh, instead a modelized, uh, consider invariance of modelized spaces of Higgs sheaves. So we have N, S, H, C1, C2, which is, um, uh, so they parameterize the sheaf with these rank two with these churn classes and phi, the Higgs field, so this is E, is a rank two coherent torsion free sheaf on S um, and phi with these churn classes. And phi is a homomorphism from E to E tensor, the canonical bundle. And I think it's also assumed that the trace of phi should be zero. So one looks at this modelized space of these things. <coughs> And there is a modelized space for this. There's a stability condition, which says basically the previous condition should, uh, for subsheaves should hold for all subsheaves which are invariant under phi. And this has a C star action. Um, by rescaling uh, this Higgs field phi, namely lambda in C star, if I multiply to a fair pair E phi, this should be just E, and then, you know, rescaling this field. And so uh, the full buffer written invariance would be, uh, say, I could call this buffer written invariant of C1. C2 would be uh, what uh, we'll see later what that means. It's in some sense the Euler number, but in some virtual sense of this. I look at this modelized space, but I look at its C star invariant part. Because, uh, so we look at the, the fixed points under the C star action on this space and uh, compute some kind of Euler number of it. And uh, one should note this fixed point set has uh, several components. So one or some of these components just correspond to the fact that phi is zero. Uh, 
I mean, so our components where phi is equal to zero. And so these components, the union of these components is just our old moduli space. So, and then there are also other components. So this is uh, sometimes called the instanton branch. And other components. Which would be called the monopole branch. So what we are computing here is only the instanton branch of it, which is the modular space of sheets. And um, there are, I think will be several people in the second week who talk about uh, of witness events. At least I know that uh, uh, La Laraka will talk about uh, of witness events, maybe also Atan Sheshmani. I don't know whether somebody else. <coughs> so therefore, you will hear more about it. But I concentrate on the instant from branch, so just on the modular space of sheaves. So we have here this, you already mentioned here is this virtual Euler number. I didn't say what that is. Maybe in this case it more. Uh, so I have to say what I mean by virtual topological invariance of such spaces. And this has to do also with the stuff I said here about. Uh, the expected dimension. <laughs> so, how much? So, virtual topological. Yeah, I should maybe say that. Uh, so, here I have this buffer Witten formula, but I'm not actually saying that I claim it to be true. I will try to explain in what sense uh, it's supposed to be true. Okay, virtual topological invariance. So, as I said, this modelized space will be usually quite singular. And it will often have many components, and these can all have different dimensions, and uh, so not of expected dimension. But it has this expected dimension uh, Vd of m. So, uh, you know, and this means that, uh, so, you know, what one could say it is that uh, it is what one could call virtually smooth. of dimension Vd of m. So and some, something about it behaves as if it was smooth of this dimension. So uh, this will mean that one will be able to define some invariants for m which behave like for a non-singular variety of dimension m. So technically, uh, what I mean by this virtually smooth is that m has a one perfect obstruction theory. So I will briefly uh, define this. So so let so maybe not in complete generality, but only what I need. So let M be a scheme which has an embedded embedding into a smooth scheme so that just avoids the most terrible uh, problem so in particular so m is embedded in some x so, for instance, M could be projective or quasi-projective. Then it's embedded into projective space. And so it's embedded into smooth scheme. And um, 
I take E to be the ideal sheaf of X and M, of M and X. So these are all regular functions on X which vanish on M. So a perfect obstruction theory Uh, on M is a complex um, a very short complex uh, just a uh, e dot of two vector bundles uh, of vector bundles on M uh, with the morphism of complexes Um, so, so we have this e minus one goes with d to e zero, and we have here this morphism phi. Here we take the ideal modulo the ideal squared, so basically the normal sheaf. So, m in X have derivative to the cotangent bundle or the cotangent sheaf of X or in this case cotangent bundle because it's one singular restricted to M such that two things hold first if I take phi as a map from the co-kernel of D so this divided by the image of a minus one uh, to the other co-kernel of D is an isomorphism. And secondly, so on this cohomology level it's an isomorphism and at this level it is at least uh, surjective. So phi from the kernel of phi of D to the kernel of D is surjective. Okay, so this is the condition. So roughly speaking, you know, this somehow is, a, so you have a, here one can somehow see the, uh, the, the cotangent bundle of X somehow is obtained here and here one has the normal bundle. If one puts it together, one has somehow the, uh, this means that this vector bundle here, this morphism of vector bundles will uh, capture both the information about the tangent spaces of our M, I mean cotangent or tangent by uh, duality, and which means how you can infinitesimally move points, and the obstruction spaces, which means how you can, what prevents you from having an infinitesimal construction, uh, infin infinitesimal um, deformation to become an actual curve. And so, so this is both covered, covered just by these global vector bundles. And so instead of having these, all these local things, you have it all captured in one thing. And uh, so we denote uh, the virtual dimension of M to be uh, the rank of this complex of vector bundles by which one means uh, this is an even dimension, this is an odd dimension, so uh, a rank, so this is the rank of E0 minus the rank of E minus 1. Uh, so this is the expected dimension or virtual dimension of 
M. And then uh, there's this theorem. Uh, so, say, Behrendt van Tecki. Uh, Li Tian, which says if you have this, uh, you have some nice structure on M. So let M be a scheme with the one perfect obstacle theory. Uh, <clears throat> then we have first M has a virtual function. So this means we have a class M there, which lies um, in the homology group, which uh, the fundamental class of a, a complex variety of dimension uh, VD would have. So this is in the second uh, two VD of M homology of M. My assumption like this, which, uh, I mean, behaves in many ways was the fundamental class of a smooth variety. And so, if we have a class alpha in the cohomology of M, we can class, so we can define the virtual intersection number just uh, we evaluate on this virtual fundamental class this class alpha Q and um, it also we will use later also that M has a virtual structure sheaf So we can consider the regular holomorphic functions on M, something else, some other sheaf of the, the, the holomorphic function on M, you know, you taking into account this virtual. So this is O M here. Hmm. I don't know. So, um, this, however, is not directly a sheaf. It's actually an element in the Groten D group of coherence. I don't know whether you just uh, finish. I review the definition. Of that, so if X is a variety, so K groups, X is a variety. Uh, we can look either at K upper zero of X. This is the Grotendi group of X. So these are formal linear combinations. Uh, vector bundles, uh, so where uh, n is some positive integer, and um, the ai are integers, and the ei are vector bundles. And this is modulus 
some equivalence relation. Namely, we have that if we have an exact sequence, um, 0 goes to E goes to F goes to G goes to 0 of sheaves, we declare that F is equivalent to E plus G. Okay? And um, K0 of X, the Grotny group of sheaves, is the same with vector bundles, with uh, vector bundles replaced by sheaves. Replaced by coherent sheaves. Okay. So, for instance, note that if uh, so, we can define churn classes of elements in the Grothendieck group of vector bundles just by uh, uh, applying formally the Whitney product formula, namely C from some AI, EI will be, so the total churn class will just be the product uh, uh, C of EI to the power AI. And so, uh, and it's compatible with this relation. And in particular, we also uh, M also has a virtual tension bundle. So this is just TM there. This is uh, E0 minus E1 in the Grothendieck group of vector bundles on M, where E lower I is the dual of E minus I. Now we had uh, in the definition of the. And then finally, we can at least define to close it up what is the virtual Euler number of M, namely, so assume that M is compact, and so, so the virtual Euler number so then I take the integral over the virtual fundamental class of what should be the top churn class, so CVD of M of the virtual tension bundle. Okay, so this is uh, the virtual order number. And this is uh, an analogy to the standard fact, maybe sometimes called Hopf index theorem, that the Euler number of a smooth variety is given by the integral over the top churn class of the tangent bundle. Okay, maybe I stop here. Thank you very much. <coughs>